Okay, this is going to be a second version of connecting Godot to Ubabuga, and uh, it's really C-sharp to Ubabuga, so fun fact, you could probably, you know, do anything that's using C-sharp, and this would work the same way. Uh, I'm going to very briefly go over installing Ubabuga just because others have done it a lot more than I'll ever need to. So you just pick a place on your hard drive where you want this to live. Uh, I type cmd in here, you will get a command prompt like so. And then after you've installed git, by the way, you will need that. Uh, once that's there, you should be able to use it from your command prompt that you open. And then I'm just going to do git clone and then uh, put in the uh, URL with the HTTPS. And you see that's going to clone the repository into whatever folder I'm running in there. Still going. So yeah, so now you see I've got this folder here. So all you have to do really is go down to start in whatever operating system you're running on. So in my case, it'll be Windows. You run that file. And then this is going to take a little while. It's going to set up uh, Miniconda, which is a local Python environment. You might have to install that uh, separately, but either way, it's going to create this uh, Python environment to run in, and then it's going to download all the modules it needs and basically set everything up. Uh, and this is going to take a little while because some of this stuff is fairly sizable, so I'm just going to speed through that. Uh, right here, you're going to see that it's going to have, have you pick your graphics card. Obviously, pick the one that corresponds to what you have. Mine's in NVIDIA, so I'm going to pick uh, A here. Uh, you can run this stuff in CPU, uh, CPU mode, and it won't make that big of a deal, but it will be pretty slow. And you'll need a decent amount of system RAM as well in order to store the model. So I'm going to pick that. And then here, it's just asking if you want to use an old version of CUDA uh, if you have a real graphics card. So in my case, that's not necessary. I'll hit N. All right, so I think that took five or six minutes on my machine, and you'll see it even warns you here you haven't downloaded the model yet. Um, so it's already running, and there's just any future time that you run that start whatever .bat file, it's going to start it up, except it won't have to do all this. So in order to get a model, uh, you'll see here, it, this is the just local host on my machine, so if you should control click that, it should open up like so. And then if we go over to model, you'll see we don't have any, like it said. So if you go to hugging face, you can get tons of these. I usually get, I get it from this guy, the bloke, but there are others as well. So just to give the very briefest overview, and I'm not an expert on this, but you'll see kind of a few categories. The main two are like GPTQ and GGUF. Uh, you'll see that after a lot of the models, at least on this page. Uh, GPTQ is if you have a graphics card to, you know, grossly simplify it. And GGUF, you can run those in C, uh, CPU mode. So if you have a graphics card with enough VRAM to handle the model, I would get the GPTQ. Uh, for whatever model, there are like over 3,000 of them just on this user alone. Um, or just GGUF if you want to run it in CPU mode. And in that case, just expect to be getting a cup of coffee while you get your AI response. So the way you would download one, um, I'm actually just, I've never used this one, so let's just have fun and test with it. You just go up to this little copy icon here, and then back in your web UI, you can paste that right here. If you're using GGUF models, you'll see here, you'll actually have to put the file name. So when you do a GGUF model, or GGML, I think is an older uh, CPU model, you can do either one. If you look at the files and versions, you'll see you'll have multiple selections of the same model. And these are different ways of quantizing, which I'm not going to go into. But, but basically, you go to these bigger ones, they get a little higher quality, but they're all slow if they're running in CPU mode. So you just want to pick one of these files that you would put in there if you were running at one of these models. And you'll see an explanation on all of these pages here down at the bottom which kind of tells you here, like, you know, what you're losing in quality for the size of the model and all that. Anyway, once that's downloaded, you're going to want to look at the uh, session tab over here and these two flags over here, API and listen. The API lets you connect to it from something else, like which is what we're going to do in C Sharp. And listen, if you're doing this across a different machine on your home network, you need listen so that it will like look for that uh, call on that port. So you can apply and restart like that, and then it'll restart the API with those flags checked. Now, if you wanted to start up with those flags every time you run it, then you go into this command flags text file. And here, example, the, the hashtag is like a Python comment out. So you just get rid of the hashtag there, and then it's going to actually implement those um, flags every time. So it, actually, those two are the most common ones. So it gives you that example. I'm just going to use those two. But any of those flags you can set in this text file. Okay, so once you've got Ubabuga up and running, I notice here it's, uh, it went to 0000, which should be the same thing, I think. Uh, that didn't work when I actually clicked on it. So just up here, you'll see I went to localhost, colon 7860. If that gives you trouble, just use localhost. So once that's there and you've loaded a model, it doesn't matter what model it is, 
and we can start chatting with it. So I basically split this out. This is the same scene as I used last time, except I broke it out into its own project. And I'm going to put the link to the Git repository. I publicized that as well, because this is a little more organized and doesn't have that wonky WebSocket stuff. So first I'm going to go through the code. It's mainly uh, these two files that are going to be the most important, the Uba Talker and the Uba Parameters script. So if we go here, I'm going to start with the Uba parameters. This is just the uh, stuff that gets sent to the API. These are like all of the fields that get sent there that OpenAI or Uba Booga in this case are going to take in. Something else to note here, if you go to localhost colon 5000 forward slash docs, which is just everything before that, uh, that's now implemented as the documentation. And you can see here, which is what we're using here, chat completions. Here it shows you all the properties. So if those properties get updated, we can change those in the Uba parameters script here. Um, but we just need the same properties that exist in here. So that's what I've done here. And anyone, uh, you can, and I actually used that example to set wherever they showed a value. You just put equals after the property that you create, and then it'll default to that when you create a new object. But that's all the, uh, these classes are. The reason you'll see a couple other classes like message up here within this same script is because here uh, this is going to be a list of messages like each message that's going back and forth between you and the chatbot it's going to be stored in a list of those messages and each message has the content which is the actual text of the message and a role and all this really is is open ai's way to control abuse so like if you were actually uh, using it in a public api sense you would have a log of each user's id that could be filled into this role this is actually simpler than the last one because we don't have to use the crappy WebSocket. This uses server sent events, which is basically kind of listening for events instead of this awful long polling method here. Um, so up here, this is just the URL that we're going to be sending to. In my case, this is my local machine. This would be your server. So if you were on another machine on your network, you would just put its IP in here, the port. As long as they continue to use 5000, that's just what makes sense here. And then this just puts those in here. And then whatever your endpoint is, this V1 chat completions. Again, that's here in the endpoints that are in the Ubabuga documentation. And it, like so if anything changes, it can just be typically updated according to that documentation. So we're going to have two events here. Um, so this script is going to provide events where it fires those events off whenever there's a text update. So as we're streaming the response, as we're getting uh, bits and chunks of the response back from the AI chatbot, uh, it's going to send off a text update event ev each time that happens. So that way, if you subscribe to that, then you can add to your text box. That's what's going to be done on the, you know, the front end, so to speak. And the text finished event is just going to be obviously when that message is finished, it lets you know. So then you can go back and, you know, say something back to it. So this prompt here, this list of messages, this is just going to store in this variable all of the chat history. Again, the message is just going to be that format here. You're going to have a role, which is the role, you know, and the content, which is just going to be the message. Nothing more complicated than that. The reason we do create it as an actual class like this is because when we use Newtonsoft uh, JSON to deserialize this into JSON, which it needs to be sent as, then we need to have a class for it in order to define these properties, and then it will automatically get deserialized correctly. Because like manually building the JSON string is a pain. This is just a static variable to store the HTTP client, which is you know a C-sharp.net object. That's what we're going to use to talk to the backend. So this prompt AI method, this is what you're going to call from another script. It's a static method, so it'll show up regardless. So you pass it the user input, which is the message you're going to send. A couple of, you know, I thought were useful parameters I put out here, and then those just get set in the Uber parameters object. Like those are, again, those fields. You could obviously expand this more so that it, uh, you know, it could take in, so that it could take in any of these parameters, and then you would just set that, uh, when you create a new object. So like right here, when I create new Uber parameters, it's just a new object with whatever defaults were set in here. And, and I set those here based on the arguments. So you could do any ones you wanted to set. You could just do that here and then pass them in uh, as arguments here. Another way you could do it is you could actually have it take in an Uba parameters object with all of that stuff already set. So just be preference there. So here we're going to add a new message, which, you know, rolls the user because it's you, the one sending the message. And the content is going to be set to whatever gets passed into it. This is your message that's getting sent. So messages is going to equal the prompt here. 
and the prompt remember is a list of those message objects. So if you look at this line right before that, what we're doing is we're adding to that list. So as the conversation goes on, uh, this prompt is going to be that entire list of messages. Each time it gets called, it's going to add the user's message uh, to that history. Here's where we convert it to JSON. Again, that takes the uh, Newtonsoft JSON um, module. So again, in the NuGet package manager uh, extension here, I just have Newtonsoft JSON. That's the only external one we, sh we should need in this case. So I just follow this format, and then you have a JSON string that's going to get sent, and that's what the API is expecting to consume. So the rest of this, this is how you construct the HTTP object that needs to be sent so that uh, you know, C Sharp can listen for the server sent events. I don't think I even use the cancellation token in this case, but I think it can be done. Uh, but just to keep it simple, uh, we're just going to create the uh, content here. And actually, I just realized I used this before. I don't need this. So let's keep that even simpler because we're going to we're doing that right here, as you can see. So we're here we're creating an HTTP request message, which is just the uh, C sharp object. Uh, post is the method that we're going to use. Uh, and then we pass in the URL, which is that which is the uh, endpoint we created up here. So the string content, um, it just has these attributes which are needed in order to send that HTTP request, you know, formatting basically. Uh, so this, uh, this await task run, you have to run it as a task so it doesn't lock the UI, uh, but all we're really doing in essence is calling this method down here and we're passing it the HTTP client and the HTTP message that we just created from the UBA JSON up here. So that's going to just call this next method right here. So again, using the message, again, this is the HTTP message. Uh, we're going to await sending this message. And this uh, response header is read. Uh, my understanding of this, it's not going to wait for all the content to come back, in which we don't want. We don't want the entire message at once. We want to get those chunks of the message as it spawns. Uh, it's just a confirmation check. Uh, and we need this uh, stream reader, basically, in order to uh, read the stuff coming back as it's coming back. So here, uh, you know, while we're not to the end of the stream, we're just awaiting read line async. So basically that translates to reading the chunk. Uh, so whatever, you know, whatever token got sent back. And server sent events have this standard apparently where uh, it, the response starts with data colon and then after that it gives you a valid JSON string. So in order to read it as a valid JSON string, we need to strip this out. So that's all that does is it confirms like, okay, we got something back that we're expecting to consume. And then this right here just strips out that data colon because otherwise it won't even be valid JSON. So here I have a method to parse the uh, UBA response essentially. So again, this is just parsing the JSON object and getting the properties from it. And this is where we find the uh, actual response from the AI chatbot. These dots in the middle are just hierarchy, basically. Like, so, you know, you have to go down a level in the tree to get to this property and then one more to get to the content. So if you just, if you look at the actual JSON output, you can just print this and you'll see what I mean there. But this is the property we need in order to get the response, the actual text from the API. Then I just check to make sure it's not blank because I was getting some blank back and, you know, it doesn't really hurt anything, but, you know, why waste time with it? So as long as it's not blank, we add whatever came back. This could be a few letters, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever token or tokens came back. We add that to the response and then we fire that event off I was talking about. So this fires the event that says, hey, we've got another chunk of text. And then you can send that to the front end and you can add to it. Um, but right here, we again, this while loop here is only while we have not reached the end of the stream. Once we've reached the end of the stream, uh, this response variable will have everything that the AI chat box sent back. So then we can add that into the message history here. Where, and like I said, I put role AI just to differentiate it as one of the responses as opposed to what you're sending it. And the content of that is now the response, which again, it should be full now that the stream has ended. And then here's where we fire the text finish. So then we're telling whoever's calling this uh, that we're done sending back the message. You can put in a new message or do whatever you want. And that's what this Uba Buga test script does. That's um, on Gaia, so to speak. Uh, so here, so again, like that gives you the functionality. I think these two uh, scripts right here to you know implement it any way you want. You would just use that uh, prompt AI and those two events. Uh, to, and then you should be able to talk to it from whatever you're implementing. Uh, this Ubabuga test here, that's just the way I'm doing it. Um, so you can see here, I subscribe to those two events. Like when text update fires off from this class, I 
uh, fire off the display text method. And down here, all I'm doing is messing with is animations, setting the uh, text box to update that new text. And uh, I have the little sound here that just plays the little text sound. Uh, same thing here with flag finish. So when uh, that update is actually finished here, the text finished event, flag finish will fire off. And again, this just stops the talking animation. This is actually old. I don't need that because I'm uh, not using the, I'm not storing the prompt in the front anymore because I tried to decouple this. I don't want it to depend on my own personal implementation of this. I want that to be stored here. So that's actually what's happening right here. This is now uh, storing it in the, you know, the form that's desired for the API and that history is going to be in here. So we don't need it here. All I do up here when I clear that out is this is just for the prompt we're sending. I'll come back to that in a sec. So you'll notice here, like when setting the, uh, you know, editable to true, all of these things I'm using call deferred or set, if uh, set, if I'm setting a variable, I'm using set deferred, or if I'm calling a method, I'm using call deferred. Basically, uh, I'm not going to claim to fully understand all of the, like, thread nonsense that goes on, but we're over here in order not to lock things up, we're calling all this stuff asynchronously. But basically, Godot does offer these methods to call uh, and set variables safely. And what it's doing is just essentially waiting for the next uh, idle time or, you know, probably between frames or whatever that it actually performs those actions. So that worked out well. It, you know, I stopped getting errors when doing that. So um, the only other part of this that I'm doing is uh, when you know when they press enter. Um, again, I'm setting the text box uh, editable to false. So that way they can't type in while it's trying to respond because that creates an obvious mess. Uh, we're clearing out the prompt because, again, this is just a variable for uh, what we're sending this message. So what I did here is like this send context up here. This is just a Boolean variable. It's gonna, it's basically going to say, am I going to send context or not? And by context, I mean, uh, you know, just an initial message or instructions on uh, like right here, um, how you want the uh, chatbot to behave. You can kind of give it personality instructions. You can write it in natural language like I did here. And then this is just quotes from the game. So that kind of sets the tone and you can make that whatever you want. So the first message I want to send at that as kind of a kickoff and say like this is uh, how I want you to talk, right? So right here, if that's true, which it starts off as by default, we're going to add the context of the prompt and a new line for just for good measure here. And then we're going to set that to false so it doesn't do it again. But you could set that to true if you, for whatever reason, wanted to put that in again. So all that's really doing is the first message is going to send the context and whatever you type in to that text box here. Uh, but otherwise, it's just going to skip over this if this is false and send the next message. And again, all of the messages are going to be stored in this list of messages. So it'll have that until you exceed the context uh, limit. So again, a Typical model will have 2,048 or 4,096 tokens that it can hold. If you exceed that, it's going to drop off. But large language models work based on kind of what came before them. It's pretty deterministic is a kind of loose way to put it. So hopefully by the time that happens, uh, the conversation's history will, will set the tone on its own. So let's give it a shot. Again, I know I went through that pretty quickly, but again, it's going to be in the Git repo. So... Uh, you know, feel free to download it. And then what I would do if you're trying to implement this on your own is replace this Uba Booga test with, you know, something attached to one of your characters. And again, just call that prompt AI and subscribe to those two events to determine what to do when you've received a response or as you're receiving a response. One thing I do want to point out is like the language model I set up is set up to run on the graphics card and it'll come back fast. So because my uh, text box will scroll, it's going to be hard to read. So I set this as max tokens per second. This is that uh, option. It'll be six tokens per second. So it'll limit the speed that it's coming back so that we can read it. By the way, this language model is just kind of funny. The one that I picked, it's not really that awesome, but for entertainment's sake, uh, Hmm, wonder why I got a blank space. Now see, if this guy had read Nintendo Power, he would have picked Mario 64. Uh-oh, uh, uh, no, nah, no, nah, you see? This really is not a bad answer. Uh, cool. Wow. 
All right, that's enough. Um, <laughs> like I said, not the smartest AI in the world, but you can put any language model you, uh, you can run basically in there. So awesome.